Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. It's your brother, the preacher. And we're here. We're part two in the book of Leviticus. As I promised, we've already, if you need to go back, subscribe and, and go back. We're in the book of Leviticus. We started our new Torah portion this week. Uh, the Hebraic name for the book is Vayikra, and it means, uh, he, and he called. And so, you know, we, we've been studying Torah portions, you know, through the weeks and stuff. And, and again, we, we started a new book. And so this is part two, because I, I started going through what the reading is for this week. And, you know, we, we really, you know, got like halfway through. So that's why I'm doing a part two. But the, the readings is Leviticus 1.1 1, 1 to 5.26 in the Hebrew. And then in our Bibles, it's uh, 6, 7, chapter 6, verse 7. And so we were talking through these, these chapters and how people, you know, obviously don't like studying the book of Leviticus. But we find out the holiness of God. We understand that God is almighty and he sets his people apart and he wants them to be he wants them to be holy and in the way they worship and in, in the way they approach God. We talked about sacrifices. We talked about korban, what korban means to draw near to God. That's what oblation or offering uh, means. And that's the that's the definition in, in, in a in a very um, Hebraic sense. And so, you know, we obviously teach from uh, a Jewish perspective. We teach from a lot of different perspectives, as you see on uh, the videos and things. But this week. We're, you know, I'm reading from the Unrolling the Scroll, which I, I love the book, and it gives us some insight on some things. So we talked about the purposes of, of sacrifice. We talked about gifts for God. We talked about obedience is better than sacrifice. And really, it's a, a, from a willing heart. It's not some superficial religious thing of just, you know, check mark. And, and uh, yeah, I go, to, I go to service. I go to church. I go here. I go to, I, go to, I, I honor the Shabbat. But your heart is 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 far from the lord you know you do it from a willing heart because of love and 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 what god has done for for us and so it's very important that your your heart condition be in a place of submission to god submission to 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 his word and understanding his word and so we, we talked about the burnt offering as a sweet aroma we are like paul says we are a, a sweet aroma. We become a sweet aroma. We become a living sacrifice unto the Lord Jesus Christ or unto God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a grain offering, which is a, basically a gift to God. If you hear the, 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 you know, the, the crew in the back there, we're in the gym. That's the way we do things here. And so, and so I've come to basically the third uh, offering in the five offerings that are done in this week. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna read a little bit, and you know, we'll pull out some some spiritual truth for us, so that we can really we can really understand, you know, the purposes of, of sacrifices. Because again, people read ah, it's, all those things are, you know, we don't have to do any of that stuff. We don't, you know, and and really, we get to see Messiah in everything. And and yes, you still offer up peace offering. You still come with with uh, oblation before the Lord, praises to the Lord, amen? And so you become a living sacrifice to God and then you offer up as priests, we're called to be priests in the earth, so you're the one operating in the temple, so you have to offer up some sacrifices, the sacrifices of your lips, the praises of your lips, the, your worship, your lifestyle becomes an offering to God, amen? So don't, you know, that it be a sweet aroma. So we kind of ended on the, the, the salt covenant, which preserves things. And we're going to move into peace offerings. So in Leviticus 3.1, it says, Now, if his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, if he is going to offer out of the herd, whether male or female, he shall offer it without defect before the Lord. You know, you can't come to God and offer up crummy worship, crummy praise, like halfway you know, it's like even here in the gym, like they get in the ring and stuff and you're going to come in, come halfway. You're going to get beat up. Now I'm not going to, you know, 
I mean, yeah, because Malachi says, you know, like, man, you offered up stuff to me that's the same thing in, in the book of Isaiah, this week's Haftarah, uh, the prophet's reading. He's like, you, you didn't offer me up sacrifices. You offered up sin to me. You offered up detestable things. I don't like away with you. And so what are you really offering up God? And so we're going to talk about the peace offering, which is the third type of gift introduced in the Torah reading, which is Shalamim. And Shalamim means peace offering. And they're, they're called peace offering because the word shala, Shalamim is related to the word Shalom. Amen. And Shalom means peace. As you see behind us here, we have the word Shalom. That's what lives in this place is peace, the peace of God, the love of God. You know, peace is destroying everything connected to, to confusion and chaos. Like the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering were voluntary. So this is a voluntary thing. It's not something for sin. It's a voluntary from the heart. Thank you, Lord. There were different types of peace offerings, thanksgiving, votive or when you do a vow and a free will offering and the Passover lamb were all peace offerings sacrifices in which one's bringing an animal partook or the animal partook they were never brought as a penalty for sin or to earn forgiveness of sin the peace offering had to be unblemished animal from the herds or the flocks but it was prepared differently from the burnt offering only the choice fats were burned up on the altar the rest of the sacrifice was divided between the person and brought the uh, who brought the peace offering and the priest and were offered sorry and were on the table of the Lord and symbolized a shared meal between the the offerer the priest and God himself so it's a it's a communion time it's a it's it's a time of Shalom, it's a time of peace and and you come and you fellowship and that's what God wants God, God wants that that man would fellowship and then God's in the midst of unity you know Psalm 133 says that, that, that behold that there's a blessing oh how good it is and how pleasant it is that brethren would dwell together in unity there's power and there's strength in unity amen the, it symbolizes a shared meal between the offer and the priesthood of God himself. The peace offering represented peace, mutual goodwill between God and the person bringing the peace offering. It represented fellowship between God and man. So it's just, it, Father, man, I, I offer up this, this peace offering because there's peace between us. There's, and that's, that's our life. That's with anything. That's with, and it's voluntary. Lord, man, I'm, I'm just... Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for everything that you you've done for us. The meat of the peace offering was to be used for fellowship meal. The man who brought the offering would invite the whole family and friends, acquaintances to partake of the feast. The peace offering were usually offered in conjunction with festivals. God loves a party. God loves a party. Families were, would travel together to Jerusalem, offer their peace offerings, and enjoy them together as a component of keeping God's appointed times. Maybe that's why the tradition of big festival meals, or that why it, from there it comes from. The next offerings we, we deal with are, are the two with dealing with sin. So the first three are not dealing with sin. They're very voluntary. They're either uh, a vow you took or or uh, a peace offering, a thanksgiving offering, or offering up sweet aroma before the Lord. And so in verse uh, chapter 4 now of this week's Torah portion, verse 2, it says, If a person sins unintentionally in any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, and commit any of them. And so this is, this is the offering for sin. So far we've learned three of the five types of offerings. Have you noticed that none of them were penalties of sin? Instead, they were intended to be gifts that 
a person could give to God out of the glad or out of a glad and willing heart. The remaining two sacrifices are concerned with sin, the sin offering and the guilt offering. Before we study them, we should take note of how the Torah defines sin, how the instructions of God define sin. Leviticus 4.1 says that a person sins when he does anything that which the Lord has commanded not to be done. So if God says don't do these things and we go about doing them, it's sin. Hey, Y'all can go that way. And these guys, they're leaving the gym. And so I believe... I believe if we look it up, First John, First John three four. So New Testament, everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. That's New Living Translation. Everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness as well. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. Whoever committeth sin also committeth iniquity. Sin is iniquity, is crookedness. Whoever committeth, committeth sin transgresses against God's law. The sin, for sin, is the transgression of the law. So that's the definition of sin, is doing something that God has commanded not to do. To put it simply, sin is breaking God's commandments. Sin is a translation of the Hebrew word chata. It's pronounced chata. <laughs> the word is an archery word. It means to miss the mark. A sin is like an arrow that falls short of his intended target. Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The word Torah is derived also from an archery term. And the, the root word is Yara. And Yara means to take aim, to go hit the mark. The Torah is the target for which we are to aim. So we're aiming at God's commandments. See, but all man has fallen short. So what does the Bible say to us? Jesus is the end of the law. Now, many people translate that and they'll say, you know, that he's the end. It's the end of it. No, that's not what it's saying. And so we break it down. The end of the law is Christ. So when we look at the, the reading, it's the word telos in the Grego. Telos means the end, end event of the issue or the principal end, the aim of the purpose, reaching the aim. It's well illustrated in the old pirate's telescope unfolding one stage at the time to function at, at full strength and effectiveness. Let's go down here to what else it says. Primarily, telo is the point aimed at as a limit. That's the limit. That's the end. Christ is the end of the Torah. He is the shining example. He's the one we are to emulate. The Bible says in, 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 in the book of John, 3 John 1.11, it says, imitate good, imitate God, imitate those things, imitate what is good and don't imitate what is evil. Well, we imitate Christ because he's emulating the Father. Oh, hallelujah. He, he's the end of the Torah. He's the end of the law. And he becomes, a, he becomes a sin offering for us because he has fulfilled all things and now he empowers us. He gives us the power by the spirit of holiness that lived in Jesus Christ, now lives in the believer. And he, we become the righteousness of God so we can carry out the righteous requirements of the law. That's Bible. That's Bible. That's not me making up something. That's Bible. That's what the Bible says. Oh, hallelujah. Sin is the translation word of chata, which we talked about. Let's look little down here. So Torah is to take aim. The Torah is the target which we are to aim. 
Jesus is that target. He is the, he's the living Torah. Amen. Sin is a matter of falling short of that target. Leviticus 4.1 says that even the intentional transgression of God's commandments is sin. Search me out. If there's any, we talked about this the other day. Search me out. If there's any presumptuous sins, Father, take it out. If there's any unknown thing, if there was, if there's, uh, I was ignorant. And I didn't know. That's why Paul says, when the law came on, man, I died. Because what I, how can I not know sin but by the law? If the anointed person, verse 3 of chapter 4, if the anointed person, I'm oh, sorry, if the anointed priest sins so as to bring guilt on the people, the Hebrew word translated sin offering is chatat. It's almost identical to the, to the word sin, chatat. Depending on who sinned, the Torah prescribes several different types of sin, uh, sin offerings. If the priest sins, he must bring a bull. If the whole community sins, the elders representing the community must bring a bull. If the elder, like a king, sins, he must bring a male goat. If any Israelite sins, he must bring a female goat or lamb. If he cannot afford a goat or a lamb, he can bring a pair of dogs. All domesticated uh, animals. They're not raptors. You're going to bring a vulture. You bring domesticated peace offering types of peaceful domesticated animals. If he cannot afford doves, he can bring flour. The ritual proceeds for the sin offering differ depending on which type is brought. Paul teaches that sin is a condition common to all men. And he says, all have sinned, as we read before. The book of Ecclesiastes says, indeed, there are not a righteous man on earth who continually does good or who never sins. Ecclesiastes 7.20. The Torah seems to illustrate the same concept here, assuming that not only the common people sin, but also the king, the elders, and even the anointed priest. Thank God for our thank God for our high priest, who who never knew no sin. He put on this sinful flesh, but he never gratified the deeds of the flesh. He overcame sin in the flesh. He it says he condemned sin. He deprived it. Oh hallelujah! He deprived it. He starved it. He never, he never gratified it. Man, we're gonna end up doing a part three. I'm gonna slow up right there. Man, what, a, what an amazing gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ. God was in, the Bible says, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. What a gift we've been given. And then we've been given the power. We've been given the power to take aim and imitate Christ through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. Through the Spirit of the living God. What an amazing thing that God, unspeakable. Unspeakable. I want to encourage you today. We're going to end up doing a part three. Because there's a lot here. There's, 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 a, you know, obviously we have to go over, excuse me, those, those sin offerings. But man, immediately it just takes me in the spirit, and it takes me to what Yeshua did, to what Jesus did. As we move into, it, as we move into this Passover season, as we moved into the, 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 the first month of the ecclesiastical year of the month of Nisan, the month of Aviv, of springing forth, and we start looking towards Passover, and we start looking towards our blameless Lamb, who was, who was who was sacrificed, who was slain from the foundations of the earth. God provided a way from the beginning because he knew man would fall short and make wrong decisions. But God is merciful and kind and tender-hearted that he would provide a lamb for his people. And all who would believe, all who would, whosoever would believe, he gives them the right to be called children of God. Oh, hallelujah. Man, uh, receive, 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 receive. Subscribe, support the ministry. Family, we love you. We're going to be doing some videos this weekend. We're going to be out in Spring Hill. This is part two of the book of Leviticus, the introduction to the book of Leviticus, and this week's Torah portion. And man, 
I just, Jesus is good. Jesus, Yeshua is good. He is good. Amen. Shalom, shalom.